If you're having a bear of a day, let Bear TV take out your growl. Watch channel 54.4, Morgan State University. Thank you all for joining me, your host, Dr. Jared Ball, for another episode of Inside the SGJC Studio. Our guests today are Marshall Eddie Conway and Dominique Stevenson. Conway has just been released after serving 44 years as one of this country's longest held political prisoners. Ms. Stevenson runs the Friend of a Friend prison program with the American Friends Service Committee and is one of our leading prison reform abolition activists and has long been and, and has been a long time advocate working on behalf of Conway and many others in and out of the prison system. Their book, published in 2011 with AK Press, is Martial Law, The Life and Times of a Baltimore Black Panther. And from that book, we learn that in 1970, the feds framed Eddie Conway for a murder of a Baltimore City police officer. He was 24 years old. They threw him in prison, took him away from his family, his friends, and his organizing, and tried to relegate him to a life marked by nothing but legal appeals, riots, and lockdowns, transfers from one penal colony to the next, and so on. But they failed. So thank you both for joining us today, on, and welcome to Inside the SGJC Studio, and welcome to our in-studio audience. So thank okay. you both for joining us. Thank you for having me. Thank you. Yeah. So Mr. Conway, first of all, it's an absolute honor to finally get to talk to you outside of a prison or outside of a prison phone. It's an honor to have you as one of our first guests at Inside the SGJC Studio. And what I wanted to just start with was to have you just give us an overview of your life, a brief biography to catch people up who might not, might not be aware. You know, how did you go from uh, Marshall Conway to a black, uh, black Panther Party member, and then of course to a political prisoner. Okay, well, I, I guess I can actually trace the beginning from Europe. Um, I was in the army, I'd been in Europe and Germany for about three years. Um, I had signed up to re-enlist to go to Vietnam, and uh, at the time I was a sergeant, and um, one morning, uh, we got the newspaper, the Stars and Stripes, which is the Army uh, uh, newspaper. And on the front of the paper was this picture of Newark, New Jersey's ride, and it had an armored personnel carrier sitting in the crosswalk of the street. And the soldier on that personnel carrier pointing a 50 caliber machine gun at a large crowd of black women standing on the sidewalk protesting. When I read the story, basically it said that the National Guard Armory had been broken into, uh, guns had been stolen, the army and the police had arrested all the males in the black community. Uh, the women were out in the street protesting about that. Uh, finally they put the National Guard from block to block and pretty much was threatening the women. And uh, as I was sitting there reading the story and looking at my uniform and realizing I was just getting ready to go to Vietnam to either kill people uh, for America or either to sacrifice my life, I realized that I was in the wrong place at the wrong time and I decided that, well, okay, there's problems here in America and I needed to come home. I uh, got out of the Army and I came home and pretty much I joined the NAACP and I joined Corps and we helped integrate Spurs Point and we did some other kind of stuff to try to get like uh, opportunities for like uh, uh, white collar jobs for like uh, black workers. And um, as I was working with those organizations and as I was working in the community, I realized there was a lot of serious problems. This was uh, 1968, it was early 68. Uh, racism was like widespread. Uh, 
there was a, a lot of oppression going on. There was a lot of, uh, of violence in the community uh, by uh, various people against young people. And uh, so I looked around to see if I could find something more concrete that I could do to help kind of like change the conditions of the community at the time. After looking at like a number of organizations, I settled upon the Black Panther Party. It was, we were feeding children. Uh, it was setting up a medical clinic. It was trying to address some of the needs in the community, uh, 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 community control of police. Uh, basically it was uh, uh, developing uh, uh, patrols to help the senior citizens go shopping and et cetera. So I decided to work with them. I joined the Black Panther Party and in the process uh, I became a lieutenant and I started uh, working with the secondary leadership in the state of Maryland and uh, some mysterious things were going on. And I started investigating, and in fact, my job was I was the lieutenant of security. So I started investigating some of these things. A uh, couple Panthers had been locked up for doing things that they shouldn't have been doing. Uh, one Panther had actually got killed in an incident that he shouldn't have been involved in. Uh, there were uh, all kinds of violations in the office and around the upper buildings that we had located. And after investigating, I found out that the organizer of Maryland's Black Panther Party, the defense captain, Warren Hart, was actually an agent for the National Security Agency. And uh, they did a national investigation as a result of my investigation, and they discovered that, in fact, he was part of the National Security Agency's program to destroy the organization. Um, he fled the country. He went to Canada. He joined Stokely Carmichael's um, organization up in Canada, uh, All People's Revolutionary uh, Party. He uh, caused disruption up there. He actually tried to set up Angela Davis with some guns and stuff. Uh, he did some other things and they discovered him and he fled and went to the Bahamas where he in turn helped disrupt some things down there. And uh, all of that is kind of like documented, but we didn't find that out until later on. Uh, uh, as a result of him fleeing the country, uh, uh, as uh, because of my investigation, uh, I was targeted by uh, a program called COINTELPRO, Counterintelligence Program. Uh, that was being operated by the FBI at the time. Um, so I'll tell you what, Mr. Conway, since we're about to have to take a quick break, let's hold okay. right there, because I okay. want to ask you a little bit more about the counterintelligence program and this investigation that led to the removal or the, the, the fleeing of Mr. Hart, mm -hmm. and then uh, what led to you uh, ultimately being incarcerated. And then, of course, we will be talking with Ms. Dominique Stevenson about your work having uh, gotten through uh, the prison program with Friend of a Friend. So this is Inside the SGJC Studio. I'm Jared Ball. We'll be back in a minute. Don't go anywhere. Wow, these are really good. You act surprised. Practice makes perfect. You don't have to be perfect to be a perfect parent. There are thousands of teens in foster care who don't need perfection. They need you. If you want to be a parent, it doesn't matter how you play, what you wear, how you dance, or even what direction life takes you. You just need to be there. You don't have to be perfect to be a perfect parent. Thousands of teens in foster care don't need perfection. They just need you. 
All right, you ready for some baseball trivia? Let's do it. What year produced the most no-hit games in the big leagues? Seven no-hitters in 1990. Wow, that's right. Now a question that's not trivial. How many children will witness bullying this year? Huh. The answer, three out of four. 75 percent? That's wow. right. How many of them will say something? Kids want to help, but don't know how. Teach them how to stop bullying and be more than a bystander at stopbullying.gov. All right, and welcome back to Inside the SGJC Studio. I'm Dr. Jared Ball, and we're again joined by Marshall Eddie Conway and Ms. Dominique Stevenson. So, Mr. Conway, we were just talking a little bit about your, your, your early political career, working with CORE, NAACP, joining the Panther Party, and then this eventual need to rid yourselves of the NSA-imposed leadership uh, and some of the ramifications of that. Um, and for those who don't know, we do just want to quickly say that the counterintelligence program was a program developed by the FBI specifically to disrupt and discredit and destroy all manner of leftist movements, including the Black Panther Party. So um, Mr. Hart runs off, disappears, or looks to cause mayhem elsewhere, and then what happens for you next? Well, pretty much the reason Hart was there and other agents around the country was that they had decided that they were going to destroy the organization. The mm -hmm. organization had chapters in 37 states. Mm -hmm. And uh, in the course of 18 months, they destroyed 25 of those state chapters. They ran off the national leadership, they uh, 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 forced a lot of the secondary leadership on the ground, uh, or they locked up a lot of the secondary leadership, and basically they collapsed the organizational structure. Uh, and that was from like uh, mid-68 uh, uh, to 1970, pretty much. Mm -hmm. They assassinated a couple of our uh, leaders uh, officially that they end up uh, being exposed for, but they also assassinated a number of our members that they never got exposed right. for. Uh, and it was only uh, four or five years later that we discovered that this program was in place and that it had destroyed us. But in the meanwhile, a lot of us would end up in the prison system. Mm -hmm. So what was the, the nature of the case? So, so the, the official charge you ended up being imprisoned for was the killing of a police officer. Yes. And at some other point, I, I would love to do it now, we don't have probably the time, but I would love to, at some point to talk with you and others uh, about the history of the Black Liberation Army and some of the other fears that, that, that emerged uh, from the police in, in terms of the self-defense and the armed struggle mm -hmm. waged yeah. by offshoots of the Panther Party that led to some of the fear um, um, that inspired their incarceration of you and others and, and further uh, 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 suppression of the organization. But the official charge was that you had killed a police officer in yes. one part of the city. Yes. Uh, and if I remember from your book, there was so much evidence showing that you were not there, you were somewhere else, I think at work even. Well, Tell us what I, happened. Yeah, pretty much what happened was there was some sort of a shooting incident in the city in, on the west side and it involved two Panthers, two members of the Black Panther Party, and two police officers. And uh, members of the Black Panther Party were arrested uh, in that particular area, uh, weapons were confiscated, et cetera. Uh, uh, two days later, they decided to include me in that uh, to pretty much take out the, the secondary leadership. Mm -hmm. And when they included me, then they locked up like 20, 30 other members of the uh, Black Panther Party. Um, at that time, I was at the office, you know, doing work, and pretty much once they determined that they didn't have anything, they brought from another prison a police informer and stuck him in my cell. Uh, they also brought a stacked deck of photos and they duplicated my photo in each stack. Mm. And they used those photos to identify me. And I stated at the time that I was innocent, uh, and I've stated like a number of times since then that I was innocent, and I've been fighting uh, for like the last 44 years to kind of like prove that. And 
uh, family at mm -hmm. some point uh, because of legal technicalities they could see that well okay this wasn't a fair trial I had been saying that all along right um, but the the whole object it was pretty much to destroy the organization mm -hmm. yeah. and you know just to back up very quickly that 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 the, as you 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 outlined what the Black Panther Party was doing mm -hmm. um, what attracted a lot of people and I think still attracts a lot of people of my generation and younger are the more flamboyant. I mean, honestly, I was drawn to that history because of the 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 the, the berets and the jackets and the guns and the and the armed self defense training and the the sort of the brash, you know, uh, um, uh, uh, black power, pride, and aggressiveness and the militancy in mm -hmm. the organization. But as you outlined, a lot of what made this organization a threat in the eyes of the state itself mm -hmm. was the support you were giving to the community. It wasn't necessarily guns and, and Marxist-Leninist ideology and so on and so forth. It was that you were simply doing good work supporting the community. And this was seen uh, as, as a need or a reason to, to destroy the organization. Is, is that about how you experienced it? Yes, that's, that's true. Um, and, and I will make a point. The, the, the guns and the parade and, and the rest of the, the stuff were symbols used to kind of like organize, to kind of like let people know. We had just came out of a terminate time in the 60s. They were still lynching. People were being beaten for like uh, riding buses, uh, people were being beaten for setting in uh, uh, lunch counters, et cetera. Uh, police dogs were being sicked on people, water hoses were being used. And pretty much what we determined was if we wanted to organize in the black community, we at least needed to be able to defend ourselves, right? The threat came from the example of using the community's resources to help people in the community and other people picked up on that kind of organizing. The American uh, Indian movement started mm -hmm. uh, organizing and feeding in their community. The uh, Latino community uh, uh, followed that example with the Brown Berets. Um, the Puerto Rican community followed that example uh, uh, with the Young Lords. And a number of white organizations followed that, White Panther Party, et cetera. And the threat was organizing in the community and having people understand that they could change their conditions if they got together and got involved and managed their resources collectively. And it became a threat. Uh, and that threat was the idea mm -hmm. that it could happen. So as you have to then force, you're forced to make this transition from being an active member of the Black Panther Party to uh, a member of the growing and still growing today uh, a population of incarcerated people. Mm -hmm. um, could you say a few words about uh, uh, what that transition was like and then what it means to be a political prisoner? Uh, how, how do you define that phrase, political prisoner? Well, pretty much the transition kind of like happened abruptly. One day I was in the post office, I was at my job. I had been working for the post office for two years. The next morning I was in a prison cell in, in solitary confinement. Uh, and shortly thereafter I was in the Maryland Penitentiary and uh, uh, the conditions in the Maryland Penitentiary was like shocking. And of course I had been a community activist so I continued to work in the uh, Maryland Penitentiary and I started organizing things. Uh, I made a point. Uh, I mean, let me stop you right there. Unfortunately, we, we don't have to stop for another quick break. Uh, my apologies. We'll come back and get you to start with that point, and then we're going to bring in Ms. Stevenson to talk about the work that you've all been doing in the prison systems. Mm -hmm. So don't go anywhere. We're still inside the SGJC studio. I'm Dr. Jared Ball. Don't go anywhere. We'll be back in, right in, in just a minute. And roll. Budget, so don't accept defeat. Now you can get covered and still buy me treats. You take care of your pets. Now it's their turn to take care of you. Visit GetCoveredAmerica.org to learn about your health insurance options. A single ember from a wildfire can travel over a mile. That ember can ignite and destroy your home or community. 
You can't control where that ember will land. Only what happens before it does. Visit fireadapted.org to learn how you can help protect your community from wildfires. So good to see you guys. So, what's up? Oh, we finally bought a place. Holy cow. You seriously have enough save to do that? We've been putting a little aside each month. Jeez, by the end of the month, we have nothing left to save. Yeah, I have no idea where it goes. Well, you're mm -hmm. spending a lot on... Mm -hmm. Is it good? Oh, God. Oh, how is my account overdrawn? When it comes to financial stability, don't get left behind. Get tools and tips for saving at feedthepig.org. All right, and welcome back once again to Inside the SGJC Studio with me, Dr. Jared Ball, where today we're talking about the Black Panther Party and political imprisonment with our guests, Marshall Eddie Conway and Ms. Dominique Stevenson. Uh, Mr. Conway, you were just telling us about this transition and extending your in the streets activism to uh, in the prison activism and becoming a political prisoner. Could you uh, pick up where you left off? Yes. Uh Basically, what I was saying was when I got in the penitentiary, I seen the conditions were like really bad, and immediately I started working with a number of young brothers in there to change the conditions. Uh, and, and let me just say this, a political prisoner is somebody pretty much that gets locked up for engaging in political activity in the community, and uh, uh, the results of that, and they end up in jail, as opposed to somebody that's trying to steal or rob, or or do some other kind of. Uh, Although we have heard some act. people try to extend yeah. the definition to say that that all of us, given the conditions we exist in in the street, are political prisoners of a sort. But I did want you to tease out that that distinction. Yeah. Well, well, that's true, and it's also true that some people that get locked up for criminal activity end up becoming conscious, right. aware, and involved, and they change their uh, what they're doing. And so they become political mm -hmm. prisoners too. But pretty much working with young people over the years, um, uh, it, it took almost like 30 years for me to kind of like uh, discover an approach that would work that would help actually save young people and motivate young people and return them to the community as whole individuals and have them in the community working to build a positive community. And uh, uh, in that 30 years, twinking the, the process, we came up with a Friends of a Friend. Mm -hmm. And that Friend of a Friend program is what I've been doing for the last 13 years. And I've been working with some really serious and interesting young guys that was destructive when I first met them. And, uh, now they're actually feeding children in the community, they're actually organizing the community, they're actually doing positive work with young brothers in the community. And to my surprise, when we came through the door, I, was say. Uh, I came in contact with one brother that's getting ready to graduate from Morgan State University uh, as a result of me encouraging him mm -hmm. to stop shooting people mm -hmm. or whatever it was he was doing, right? Right. right. But uh, so, that that program is my life. It's my future. It's what, you know, I did it throughout the whole prison uh, uh, incarceration time. Uh, uh, I've, I've actually been enriched and rewarded by it, mm -hmm. and I intend to do it like for the rest of my life. Well, and as have I, because uh, as a as a you know someone who had claimed that he was involved with activist work and radical ideological thinking and work and all that. Um, I had not been as, as involved with uh, 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 political prisoners. I'd written a few, st obviously studied a few, learned about your life, but it wasn't until Ms. Dominique Stevenson and I got put in touch that, that I really uh, uh, um, got more involved, and in not only in coming into the prisons, and, and Dominique, as I've told you off the air, I credit you with getting me over my phobia of even going in, because I was like, I don't even want to go in. I was scared, like, that somebody would be like, oh, we got him now, let's leave him in here now. You know, so I was like, the, the you know, but, but working with you in the Friend of a Friend program, for me, has been personally enriching. I just want to say that publicly, and obviously it's been uh, uh, great for many others. Tell us about the Friend of a Friend program, and please, if you would, start with where the name itself comes from. Okay, the name um, itself comes from the term that was used on the Underground Railroad. It was a passcode when folks were escaping and they're going to a safe house. Who sent you? A friend of a friend. And so because we look at um, 
imprisonment as enslavement. I mean, when you really look at the history of prisons and how they began to grow, you see a connection to the end of so-called chattel slavery here in the U.S. So we took that term. Um, I think for a while we were kicking around the name and we wanted to name it maybe the Harriet Tubman something or something, you know. And I don't, also being connected to a Quaker organization, and many Quakers were involved in the abolition movement, um, you know, the name just worked out that way mm -hmm. for us. So tell us about how the program itself works. By the way, Friend of a Friend is also, I mean, it, well, well, it's also, it, it's a good way of, of, of maybe, in a sense, um, disarming those who would be afraid of something coming into the prisons called the Harriet Tubman you know, Freedom <laughs> Society. Or uh, so th I, I think it's slick on that level too, but, uh, but tell us how the program works and what exactly you all do. And then in, mm -hmm. in, in our next segment, we're gonna actually meet some of the young brothers you've been working with. But uh, tell us a little bit about how the program works and, and okay. what successes or struggles you've all encountered. Um, you know, it works differently at every prison because it's based on the population there, it's based on what the individuals want, but for the most part it's a six month long mentoring program where um, the mentors generally select young men. They may, most of these men, I also have to say this, many of the people who are connected to a friend of a friend have been doing mentoring for years. They have been doing positive things already in the prison population. We just were able to come in and help with a structure. But it goes on. Folks who are conscious are going to do work to better their community while they're inside and, and come out and do it. But anyway, we bring these men in for like a six-month period where they're working with the mentors and, you know, uh, group um, sessions, like on a weekly basis for the most part. And after that period, some of them actually may choose to become mentors. But a lot of stuff happens in that, during that group process. Um, a lot of dynamics take place. These men come in, they see certain people in there, you see people in there who you respect, and these folks are talking about certain issues. It helps them to open up. Um, we take people wherever they're at. They can still be affiliated with a gang or street organization. They can be affiliated with any religion, so there's a lot of diversity in the room. Um, and it's just a, a safe space for people to talk about, you know, real issues that they're dealing with in their lives. Some of those men have come out um, of the prison system. Some have come out through work release, and we were able to hire them temporarily um, to begin to develop a program outside. And so the outside program, we actually work with, well, the men work with youth. Uh, for instance, they were at a group home last night, basically taking the same approach that's used in the prison where it doesn't feel like a social services model. It's sort of like, I've been there, you know, creating a big brother since we try to develop or establish a sense of community. They also do a survival program in Gilmore Homes, handing out food, clothing. Um, we're looking at doing other youth projects there too in West Baltimore. You know, you've also, you know, you, like I said, you brought me in, you brought other uh, uh, faculty and teachers and, and people who teach uh, theater, uh, Brother Bashi Rose and others. Uh, and what I've noticed is that, like, just like you said, you get this eclectic mm -hmm. mix of, of, of men in the room. Mm -hmm. um, and I, one, one of the things that I've appreciated from, from that class is that a lot of the students in those classes, are, uh, quite honestly, are more interested in being strong, mm -hmm. good students than I find even in my Morgan State classroom sometimes. So it's, it's like it's, it was a welcome experience on that level as well. Mm -hmm. Um, and, and when we come back in just a minute, we are gonna uh, talk to some of the brothers that you've been working with, but I did wanna ask you one quick thing very quickly. You mentioned this point about the relationship between prisons and slavery. Mm -hmm. Well, we'll start that when we come back, because I want you to tell, tell, if you would, our audience here, one of the things you told me once off the air about your impressions when you first walked in mm -hmm. uh, to do some of this work. So don't go anywhere, we'll be right back with more of Inside the SGJC Studio. I'm Dr. Jared Ball, we're here with Marshall Eddie Conway, Dominique Stevenson, and you. So don't go anywhere, we'll be back in just a minute. Peace. It's a beautiful day out here, sunny today with light breezes, giving way to clouds in the afternoon. We could see some light precipitation to moderate precipitation later on, followed by powerful storm-like conditions. 90 miles per hour winds are expected. Authorities are asking everyone, stay indoors. Come on, that's it, let's go.
Cook foods to the right temperature using a food thermometer. 3,000 Americans will die from food poisoning this year. Keep your family safer. Check your steps at foodsafety.gov. <laughs> You guys going to my party on Friday? Yeah, dude. It's gonna be crazy. <laughs> All right. What's up, dude? I'm loving your jacket. <laughs> don't be such a fag. If you don't mean it, why say it? Words hurt. Think before you speak. All right, and welcome back again to Inside the SGJC studio with me, Dr. Jared Ball, where today, again, we're talking with Marshall Eddie Conway and Dominique Stevenson about the Black Panther Party, political imprisonment, mass incarceration, and right now, the Friend of a Friend program. And joining the set, and we'll get to these brothers in just a moment, are two brothers from that program, Waheed and Green Bay. So, Dominique, you were saying just a moment ago, uh, we were asking, I was asking you about this analogy you were drawing between the old system of enslavement and modern day mass incarceration. And I was hoping you would recount one of the stories you told me once uh, about how you, what you saw going into the prisons and why you continue to draw that analogy. Okay. The, the first time I had been into a prison was the House of Corrections. And I had never been, like, other than a visiting room. And that was actually a very limited experience. Um, I had never even had an idea other than movies what, you know, prisons look like. Um, and so going in there and walking through, like, the housing area, there were, like, two tiers. And all you see were black bodies. And it had the feeling of, of what, to me, like a slave ship looked like, what slave pens must have looked and felt like. Um, also going to places like Hagerstown or Cumberland where you have mostly white staff and you have mostly people of African descent. It, it has the feel of a plantation. So the, the, you know, to me it's bigger than an, an analogy. It's real. You feel it going into those places. So as we turn and bring in these two brothers, I want, you know, I wanted to, to have you all talk a little bit about how the program has, has worked for you and uh, um, um, what you think the importance of a friend of a friend program has been. Uh, to your lives and, and to the lives of the, the, the men you work with. Start with you, Green Bay. Yeah, um, me personally, I came into the program in 2007. Um, I was introduced to the program by the brother Eddie Conway, which is here today. Um, started off at the book club there. Um, that was one of the things that kind of caught my interest because we never had nothing like that inside of that institution that I was at that you get a chance to read a book about your own people, it's written by your own people, and you have a discussion, dialogue about the book and what your opinion was about the book. Um, the Friend of a Friend program to me was unique because it didn't discriminate on who was allowed to come inside of the program. Um, I was faced with guys that I knew that was basically like some, what you call real dudes, that something to slap you at any given time, or even help you at any given time. And they was accepted as one of our own. And I was accepted as, you know, as family inside of that program. Because the brother one time, um, I like to tell a story that we walked the yard that he said, well, you have energy, but I'm gonna show you how to channel your energy in the right direction. You can be useful in the thing that you say you wanna do. And it impacted me greatly because not only did I get a chance to, to talk about it, now I get a chance to do what it is that I talked about. And I love giving back to the people. And um, it's another thing about the program, it helps you to think, in which a lot of other programs don't. Real life situations, not just a situation that people looked at as mine. I'm talking about like real life situations when you get outside into communities that you're faced with. Even to the point that you're coming back to your old neighborhood and not being accepted as you once was. How do some people think outside of that box, in which a lot of us can't think out of the box. And that program basically helped me to get back into my community and be accepted, and if I don't get accepted, still be able to do the things that's necessary for my community. You know, I did want to ask you, one time you were in one of my classes, and I don't even know if you remember this particular incident or instance, but you were talking about something you just kind of said, that, that the, the different ways that your neighborhood viewed you once upon a time, now you're coming back into that same community, but in a different way. 
you remember what I'm talking about? You were talking about the way it was like, it, w at one point, seeing you meant one thing. Now, people still see you, but it means something entirely different. Uh, could you follow on that point, do you, if you remember what I'm saying, now what I'm talking it's about? like, when, when they see me at first, it was like, okay, things about to start dropping off again. Meaning like, the block about to be hot, and if you ain't from around here, they're definitely gonna run you away from around here. Now it's like, oh, the big brother back. Mm -hmm. You know, the big brother now, it's like, man, look, tighten up. You can't, don't, don't, don't trap right now while they coming around the corner. So they're bringing out the, um, the lunches or they passing out the clothes. Watch your mouth when they come around. Those type of transitions that started happening because of the impact that now we have on the community with the program. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And while he, you know, same question, how, how have you seen this interaction with, in, in, with friend of a friend and, and, you know, having been in and now being out working with this same program? Um, for me, I mean, the thing that attracted me to me attracted me to it the most once I actually got in um, was just that that it's not a program realistically. Like it sounds good, like you know, front of a front program. This this is an organization to me, you know. It, it, that, that's the first thing that attracted it to me. And the second thing, um, I'm paraphrasing though, but it's a saying by Malcolm. He said, when you come out on this battlefield, you leave your God at home. And everybody who in a program pre pretty much do that. You know what I'm saying? You got everybody from every which your faction, you know. Whether it's blood, crip, you Muslim, you crip, I mean, I'm Christian, it don't matter. Like, ev everybody's still out there on the forefront together fighting for the same purpose, you know. And everybody trying to help one, each one, teach one. So that was the thing that attracted me the most, you know, because um, especially coming, coming, coming home, every, everybody say, like, okay, I want to do this. You know, I want to help the people. I want to be able to. I want to be able to not be the same person I was when I went into the um, when I went into prison. But uh, it's not really a lot of outlets to be able to do that. You know, people judge people who come home and then they they wahid the day and then they buy the Joe again tomorrow. You can't really judge them because it's it, it, it's, it's nothing for people to come into and to fall into. So um, that's what it allowed me to do. Most of all, it it allowed me to be who I said I wanted to be. You know, I I I didn't I didn't I didn't want to go back to you know terrorizing the community in so many words. I wanted to help help the community, and this allowed me to do that. So it allowed me to be realistically the man that I am. You know, I do want to ask both of you also. You know, Green Bay, you alluded to this already. You know, for for those of us on the outside, particularly those of us who I said a moment ago who who you know sort of fashion themselves as being in in some sort of movement or appreciating movement we would see marshall eddie conway one way you know we would you know in some cases you know probably idolize you or your experience him and his experience um we you know, uh, 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 interact with him in, in one way i'm wondering how his presence in in prison with you uh, impacted you. I mean, did, were, were, did you all? How did you all interact with him? How did you all see him? Did you? Did it? Did it did, was there a transition from you know just just an older prisoner to seeing him as sort of a a, a political leader of some kind? Or, or, or how did that? How did that all work? You understand what I'm? If you understand what I'm getting at? Yeah. Because I mean, man, Eddie was never locked up together, mm, and that's right, even right, more right. just to just to to show you the power of a friend of a friend. I never met the man face to face. Never okay. touched him. Not never got to embrace him. But at the same token, we still on the same forefront, even though I'm in a different prison. Mm -hmm. But we still, we, we, uh, the, the ideas are aligned, you know. So for me, it was, it was different than mm -hmm. it, it was for the big brother. Mm -hmm. But meeting him when he came home wasn't no big thing. We used to talk, you know, damn near every single day. So it was like, all right, well, I ain't meet my grandfather, so I'm ready to meet him. Right, That's right. how it was for me personally. <laughs> Green Bay? Um, to me, the big brother, mm -hmm. you know. He the um, brother that you see that, that that been through the struggle and still has his sanity, mm -hmm. he still has his digger, dignity, mm -hmm. he still has his integrity. You know, that's, that, that means everything. Mm -hmm. That you can go through the years inside of those institutions and still haven't curbed over. You basically still firm, you're still strong. He's mm -hmm. the big brother. He know when to slash you and then he went no one to talk. Mm -hmm. You know, right. and the slash now is coming with that firm understanding of life and what you might not even know about. Right, so. right, right. All right, so we, we're going to take one more quick break, and then we're going to come back with much more on Inside the SGJ Studio. I'm Dr. Jared Ball. We're going to come back again with one more segment with our guest here, friend of a friend, Black Panther Party, political imprisonment, mass incarceration, and much more. Don't go anywhere. We'll be back, back in just a minute. Peace. Hey, Ma. I got the job. You got the job. Welcome aboard. I've got a job to do today. Have a good first day at work, Mom. Donate to Goodwill. Help provide job training in your community. Hart, what's going on? I'm leaving. Why? What did I do? Not enough. You constantly ignore me. You barely eat anything healthy. 
You're half as active as you used to be. The pressure is just too much. I quit. Okay, I get it. I'll do better. Just please, don't leave. Okay, but remember, if I go, you go. Listen to your heart. Don't let it quit on you. Uncontrolled high blood pressure could lead to stroke, heart attack, or death. Get yours to a healthy range before it's too late. Today, one out of every four American kids is Hispanic. That means many of the future doctors who will care for us, the engineers who will build our cities, the scientists and entrepreneurs of our country can be your kids. We all know how hard it is for you to send them to college. This is why we want you to know you are not alone. And every day, more people support you to make it happen. Many support you. And the Hispanic Scholarship Fund helps you prepare, plan, and pay for your kids' college education. Learn more at hsf.net. All right, and welcome back once again to Inside the SGJC Studio with me, Dr. Jared Ball, and our guests today, Mr. Marshall Eddie Conway, Dominique Stevenson, and two brothers from the Friend of a Friend program, Waheed and Green Bay. And before we wrap up our conversation, we do have some audience questions that we want to entertain. So we'll ask our first question to come on up, and uh, or first audience member to come on up and ask your question, please. Uh, how you doing, Mr. Conway? Right. My name is Stephen Copa. Um, I want to know what's the difference between the Black Panther Party then and the new Black Panther Party now. Well, the difference um, in a nutshell is that the original Black Panther Party uh, was dedicated to service to the community. The new Black Panther Party is has another kind of program that we don't understand at this point. All right, thank you very much. And uh, yeah, that's the new Black Panther Party, Malik Shabazz and others. Mm -hmm. uh, um, uh, very active, but not necessarily following the same program. All right, um, you know. So anyway, thank you very much for the question. Let's, let's bring up uh, another one. And uh, how you doing? Yes, sir. Thank you. My name is Eddie Musa. I want to know um, how are you acclimating to life post imprisonment, like in the 21st century? What's the hardest? What's been the hardest part for you? People walking around with the Bluetooth in the ear. <laughs> They're talking to themselves, and I, I'm, I'm wondering what's going on. I keep trying to answer them. But pretty much I'm adjusting. Okay. Yeah. All right. Thank you. And I think we have one more from the audience. All right. How you doing, Brother Conway? All right. Harris. Um, my question was, what um, other works in, in the um, Baltimore City area are, are you and Friend of a Friend involved with um, that might get out? information on political prisoners and um, things that you guys are involved in? Well, we, uh, we go to schools and we talk to young people and we talk to young people about their history, their culture and so on, so a political prisoner issue comes up there. Uh, we go into the community and we feed young people, we work with rec centers, we go into churches and stuff like that, uh, and we're going to probably expand that in the future. Thank All you. right. Thank you very much. So in the few minutes that we have left, I did want to follow up on that, that, that last question. You know, what, what kind of work comes next? Um, and of course, first of all, I want to thank you very much for joining us, for all of you for joining us and for the work that you do mm -hmm. uh, and encouraging many more of us to get involved. Um, but uh, uh, um, yeah, so coming back, you're going to be working with the Friend of a Fr Friend program, uh, staying in Baltimore. So you can be, we, can, we can expect to see and hear much more about the work that you all are doing. Um, was there something more specific to what, what was just asked that you could tell us about in terms of projects coming up or specifically ways for people to reach out to you all who, who hopefully might want to join this kind of effort after now having uh, seen this program? You know? Yeah, because I, I just want to say this. One of the things that I learned while I was in the prison was that you can help people turn their life around. Uh, they can become aware of their responsibilities, they can become committed to working in the community, but they're stuck in the prison. Mm -hmm. And they're stuck in the prison sometimes for five years or 10 years. The problem is we need to reach young people before they get caught up in there and help turn their life around. So we need people to actually help us get in touch with the uh, Friends of a Friend or through the uh, American Quaker uh, Society and 
come on board and help us reach young people and help us go into the junior high schools or middle schools now that is uh, <laughs> help us <laughs> you know go into the rec centers and so on and and bond with young people because that's pretty much they want to talk they want to communicate but there's a disconnect as they stand on the corner in the community there's a certain amount of fear we need to overcome that and kind of like uh, uh, bridge that gap and communicate with them before they get sucked into the prison system. To what extent would you say that there are differences in the material conditions facing black people today versus when you first got locked up and were active with the Black Panther Party? In other words, is there anything that is, that is, that is old or, or irrelevant that was in the original Black Panther program that wouldn't, you wouldn't suggest be updated today? Uh, all those programs then are necessary now. The problem is that we have the drug problem, mm -hmm. um, but we also have a massive unemployment problem. And then we have a disconnect between uh, 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 segments of our population that has become middle class or better, and a, a, a vast majority of our population that is still uh, impoverished or on uh, the SNAP program and so on. That disconnect and uh, uh, takes away not only role models, but it leaves the, those people that are uh, in the other uh, stratum uh, without any support, help, mm -hmm. guidance, leadership, et cetera. And that's something we have to do. We have to take charge of that and bring that back into uh, connectedness with the other part of our community so that we'll have a whole community mm -hmm. and we'll be able to use those resources in both segments. Mm -hmm. yeah. And as we unfortunately have to get ready to close out, Dominique Waheed Green Bay, what would you say to, or what are the things that you would say or have said to in our classes, to our students, to our faculty, uh, um, that, you know, what message would you like to carry to, to all of us here uh, about what we could do, our relationship to this element of the struggle? Start recognizing that somebody opened the doors for you. You opened the doors for somebody else. Somebody reached a hand out for your loved ones, you reach your hand out to somebody else's loved ones. Why he? He summed it up. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So Dominique, you know, when, when you, when you uh, often, you know, come to my class or other classes, mm -hmm. uh, or you are explaining this program to, to other people to, who are not immediately involved, you know, what, what types of things do you say, uh, to the extent that Green Bay didn't sum it all up? Yeah. That it's really just about like love, mm -hmm. you know. Um, there's that quote by Che, you know, the true revolutionary is guided by great feelings of love. Um, that's it for us. That we're guided by feelings of love for our people, for our community, and we want to see things change. We don't want to see our folks living in the conditions that they continue to live in. Mm -hmm. You know, it occurred to me to ask you, you know, since we have at least a little bit of time, you know, you have, you said something I, that is, of all the things that you've said since we've, we've known each other that has stuck with me, you said um, that Revolutionary Suicide by Huey Newton, mm -hmm. you thought was, had more of an impact or was a stronger read than Malcolm's autobiography. Mm -hmm. And for people like me, that's, you know, blasphemy, mm -hmm. you know, but as I've been going back and reading it, I, 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 I think mm -hmm. you have a good point. And I'm wondering if you could quickly summarize why you think that is. And, and not that we're saying one or over the other, we would advocate all, you know, and, and more. But I was just curious, you know, what, what you thought that, that Huey was saying mm -hmm. that maybe speaks to, to you or to these, to these yeah. efforts more than what, what Malcolm said, and or what was constructed wrong, as Malcolm's autobiography. Um, autobiography and Malcolm X definitely impacted me. My son was named Malik. I was mm -hmm. reading it when I was pregnant, you know. <laughs> but um, Huey Newton, where he talks about I am we, if I had to pick out one thing, that concept of I am we, I, we, all of us are the people. We all have relationship as, as people of African descent, and we all, all have responsibility to each other. The book to me is one of those reads that helps you understand how to organize in your community. He's at the time that he wrote it, it was very recent, you know, the Panther Party had been around for maybe a few years, but he poured into that book a lot of what went into organizing in the community. So I always found it very useful. It's, to me, that's my Bible. Yeah. No, <laughs> I, and I, you know, it was just, just 
Well, I want to thank you all for joining us. And, and, and Brother Conway, I, I just want to say it's, it's great to see you not only free, but free and relatively healthy and strong, as Green Bay was saying. Um, we watched Herman Wallace come out just in time to, to pass. We watched even uh, uh, um, uh, Marilyn Buck be released just in time to pass, you know, very disrespectfully. It's, it's great to see that. And, and we thank you all for your efforts in helping Brother Eddie. And uh, we look forward to building with you in the future. So thank you all for joining us for another edition of Inside the SGJC Studio. I'm Dr. Jared Ball. And as we always end, as another former Panther used to say, as Fred Hampton used to say, to you we say peace if you're willing to fight for it. So peace, everyone.